I'm here with my old friend, Kenneth Slowick. Ken is a curator of musical instruments at the Smithsonian Institution, where he, with other people, looks, looks over one of the most important collections in this country or anywhere. He's also a virtuoso performer on a bazillion different instruments. He plays the gamba, he plays the cello of all sizes and kinds, he plays the forte piano, he plays the harpsichord, he plays the organ. I've heard him do all those things amazingly well. Hard to believe that he has time for any of any other things than practicing his nine different instruments. But in any case, Ken, thank you so much for being with us um, in this series of talks. As you know, we're, we're trying to find out from people sort of how they began in historical performance or early music or whatever we will call it by the time we get around to doing this. So can you tell us about how did you get started with music and how did you get started with, with early music? Tom, I'm afraid that I really should have practiced at least one of those instruments rather more. I might have been better. I'm reminded of what the well-known harpsichord builder William Dowd once said when asked to what he contributed his success. Along with a great deal of hard work, a large part of it was being in the right place, with the right idea, at the right time. I count myself fortunate to have passed my pre-adolescence during what may have been a kind of golden age for the arts in America between the Second World War and the Vietnam War. Times are different now, so many of my experiences may have no direct relevance to your students, Tom, though I hope they may have some resonance. So here goes. There was often classical music to be heard in our house, as my father enjoyed playing recordings. Among family photos are several of me as a toddler holding a black disc in preparation for putting it on what we called the record player, which was at a conveniently low height for me to be able to access it. A harbinger, perhaps, of things to come, because my career has been largely defined by the scores of recordings I've had the privilege to make. Aside from singing, my first opportunity to produce music myself came when I was about four and a half, when my grandmother's player upright piano came into our house. My mother and I started taking lessons simultaneously, and I remember being very jealous at about three weeks in when she was assigned a piece that I could recognize. It was a little arrangement of the Andante from the Haydn Surprise Symphony, which I knew from records. But the mind of a four or five-year-old being more porous and receptive than that of a 34 or 35-year-old, once I had figured out music notation, I sped past my mother, and soon I reached the point in the series of pedagogical books the teacher used where my small hands could not reach some of the chords the more difficult pieces demanded. The teacher was a good one and set me to playing little preludes of Bach, then the inventions, the symphonias, some of the French suites, and so on, so that early on I had that language in my ear and also under my fingers. My teacher also made me do structural and harmonic analysis, even at that very early age, and once presented me, I remember, after I'd won some local contest, with a copy of Walter Emery's nice little book on box ornaments. Now, part of my father's pleasure in playing all those recordings was that, as a stage director, he always had it in the back of his mind somewhere, could I use that music in one of my plays? So in 1962, when he was he was preparing a production of Sheridan's The Rivals, he brought home a recording with which I immediately fell in love. It was of the D minor Paris, uh, sorry, the D minor quartet from the second production of Telemann's Tafelmusik in the version for two flutes and recorder. And it was on one of those old Archif recordings, which you'll remember Tom came with extensive notes, not only on the album back, the LP format provided quite a lot of space for these after all, but also on a sleeve insert that contained more information, not only who was playing and in some cases what instruments they were using, but also when and where the recording was made, what edition of the music was being used, and so on. The bass line, I read, was being played by one Johannes Koch on an instrument that was called the gamba. The recording was made in 1953, one year before I was born, and I heard it in 1962. So I thus grew up with the awareness that in some corners of the musical world, at least, there were attempts to achieve some sort of historical performance accuracy. Koch was in the circle that also contained August Wenzinger and others whose orbit centered around the Schola Cantorum Basiliensis, which Wenzinger had co-founded in 1933. 
Koch later recorded the Bach Gamma Sonatas with Gustav Leonhardt, and although we now think of him as part of the old, 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 old school, he was also, though I never met him, part of a bridge for me into the world of historical performance. There was an orchestral instrument program that began in the fourth grade at my local public school, and there I took up playing the cello. The young strings teacher was primarily a good professional singer who also played the violin. And because I didn't need to be taught the rudiments of music by that point, at the end of a few months of instruction, she confessed to my parents that to go further, I would really have to have a good cello teacher. So I went off to audition for a kindly local woman who was a member of the Lyric Opera of Chicago cello section. I played for her the prelude of the second Bach suite, of which I was at the time passionately enamored, still am for that matter. Sensing that, she let me play it through in its entirety before telling me that I was using violin fingerings. So it was back to square one to rectify my left hand technique. When I was about 12, I really wanted to get a harpsichord, and so I convinced my parents to let me buy and assemble one of those original $150 Zuckerman kits with the straight bent side, now known semi-affectionately as the Z-Box. I eventually built several other Zuckerman kits when they had moved on to more authentic Flemish and Italian designs, but even that clunky first instrument was, I felt, a step for me away from Bach on the piano uh, and to a place that would allow me to explore a different palette of articulative approaches. Also around that time, I became aware of the fact that there were important pieces out there to be learned, whether or not there was any immediate performance goal for myself. By the time I was in high school, I not only built that harpsichord, but used it to play through both volumes of the Fitzwilliam original book and virtually all of Bach's keyboard music, some of it from Dover editions, but much of it from the old Kalmus editions, which were filled with footnotes giving alternate readings from various sources. Not really critical reports, perhaps, but nevertheless making me aware of the field of source studies. Mesmerized by Leonard Bernstein's presentation of Bach's St. Matthew Passion in one of his New York Philharmonic broadcasts, I undertook to learn it by heart. And using an old Merck soprano and alto recording where for some never explained reason found lying about our house, I never heard my parents play them, I played duets and trios with myself, multi-tracking using my father's old Weber tape recorder and a newfangled and oh-so-portable cassette recorder that I had purchased. Intrigued by Stockhausen's Gesang der Junglinge, I also used those same machines to try to create, with the help of some rather primitive Radio Shack sine wave generators, some electronic constructions of my own, a step beyond my simplistic earlier attempts at making musique concrète. Perhaps more importantly, and the reason for mentioning them here, these experiments gave me a hands-on appreciation for what Walter Carlos and Benjamin Folkman did with their 1968 Moog synthesizer album Switched on Bach. It was a perfect example not only of some amazing manipulation of high-end analog technology, but at the same time an ear-bending application of what Richard Taruskin would call out some 15 years later as some of the rhythmically rigid modernist or geometricist tendencies that still persist, in many cases, in early music. All this is not to claim that I was doing any of this right, but it was being done and I was building a cache of familiarity with important corners of the repertoire. From the second grade on, I'd always been asked to play the piano for our school singing, so it seemed logical to me, given the chance to earn money by, throughout my three-year high school career, accompanying voice lessons at the local college. In this way, I got to learn certain portions of the beat, opera, and musical theater repertoires, at least in a superficial way. And I also realized that learning German to complement the French I was already studying in school would be an important thing to undertake. The recordings of the major Schumann and Schubert song cycles that I've made with Max von Egmont, John Elwes, and William Sharp, each a wonderful singer who knows how to pay attention to the text, certainly are rooted in these earlier experiences. I was also fortunate to have had, among my various cello teachers, Carl Fru, who had a real connoisseur's eye for instruments, coupled with a steady stream of royalty payments from his activity in the, at that time, booming Chicago commercial music scene. In those days, before the instrument prices went through the roof, he had been able to assemble a collection of about 20 first-rate cellos. <laughs> 
After I left his tutelage, he acquired two strads, but while I was studying with him, he had examples by a number of the other big names. Um, Amati, Guarneri, Gofriller, Techler, Testore, Grancino, Galliano, Bernadel, and so on. And he would bring a different one to his teaching studio, along with a box of a dozen bows, he had about 150 of them, to each lesson. So each lesson would include, here, try that on my cello, or what does this bow do on your instrument? It was also about the time that the steel strings, known as the Tomastic Spiracore, were first coming over to this country. They had been around in Europe for a few years already, but here people were just discovering them. And for the cello, that meant especially the G and C strings, since the A and D in common use were already metal. Now I don't know any modern cello students who don't play with those strings or something very like them with the metal or synthetic cores. But of course the whole art of tone production on a gut string is quite different, and you need to work very carefully to get a gut string to do what you want, whereas the steel strings respond almost immediately, but always in the same way. Some things that are perfectly possible on gut are totally impossible on steel, and vice versa. So that was an important organological evolution through which I actually lived, and from which I subsequently retreated. <laughs> I also discovered about that time that people who were one or two generations older than I and who would play the cello in their youths, remembering, or remembered rather, using raw gut A strings and D strings. So the shift to the kind of sound we have now in modern string playing really happened very much within living memory. It was about this time that I began to work as a professional cellist in Chicago. In and amongst my other freelance work of lesser interest, my main gigs were playing with Music of the Baroque, which was a modern instrument group with an excellent 30 or 32 piece chorus, whose orchestra contained many players from the Chicago Symphony and the Lyric Opera Orchestra. The group still exists, it's now in its 50th year and conducted by two Brits, Jane Glover and Nicholas Kramer. Secondly, the contemporary chamber players of the University of Chicago, led by the iconoclastic composer and MacArthur Genius Award recipient, Ralph Shapey, whom I also consider a big influence. Thirdly, another contemporary group in residence at the Chicago Museum of Contemporary Art, named after Paul Clay's multimedia painting, The Twittering Machine. And fourth, the commercial studio work of which I did quite a lot, and some of which is still offering me royalties. Thank you very much. It's a bit of an odd thing for me to see in this time of COVID, all the ensemble performances, the industry of which I much admire, which have been put together with the help of various kinds of stacking software or click tracks. I can't help thinking, you know, I did my click track work in the 70s, mostly with the help of 32 track, two and a half inch wide analog tape. And I have absolutely no desire to put back on that rhythmic straight jacket. But I also had the opportunity to work with some major figures in the world of popular music, including Frank Sinatra, Lena Horne, and Tony Bennett. Their highly expressive uses of deliberate asynchrony from the rhythm sections were, for me, living examples of how Mozart and Chopin had described rubato, in which the right hand weaves above and around the steady left hand accompaniment. One of the things that gave me a break at the beginning of my career was when at the last minute, for some reason I can't recall, the cellist who was scheduled to play continuo for the Music of the Baroque performances, St. Matthew, uh, sorry, the St. John Passion performances, had to bow out. So my teacher, who knew the contractor very well, said, he's the one to get. He likes that Baroque stuff. I should say at this point that all of my teachers and my fellow students and the professionals I worked with, when they learned that I had begun to play the gamba, and I'll get to that in just a moment, they all said, as if they had been coached together, oh, so I hear you're really interested in playing the, and they went, Gabba. In their defense, none of them had at that time in the hinterlands of Chicago ever heard any decent Gabba playing. But it was in that same spirit that my teacher said, get him, he's the one, he likes that Baroque stuff. So four hours for the rehearsal for the evangelist recits in the St. John Passion had been set up. I went. The organist was there, he was a real veteran, having played the piece several times before, and a wonderfully expressive uh, tenor named William Waman, who also knew the piece very well. So we started and sang through the first recit, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. And the concertmaster and the conductor and the contractor 
who had all been sitting on the side watching just to see what I would impl when I would implode, sat there with their jaws dropping. And when we had spent about 30 minutes getting to the end, or whatever it takes to sing straight through all those recits, they said, how can you do that? And I said, well, I happen to know both the words and the music to this piece and others. That's what I'm always advising the students. Do you want to get a job? If you're going to be out there, you should learn the repertoire, just as modern instrument students learn their books of orchestral excerpts. There are the big name pieces, the four large Bach choral works, the orchestral suites, the better known cantatas, the three Monteverdi Vespers, uh, operas rather, and the Vespers, the uh, big personal pieces, especially maybe Dido, Telemann's Der Tag des Gerichts, and a few others of his oratorios, major works of both uh, Handel and Rameau, and so on. The Baroque repertoire is much larger now than it was in my student days in terms of what's being played, but still those pieces are at its core, I think, at least for jobbing. When I was a freshman at the university and for a few years thereafter, I was principal or co-principal cellist of the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, which had the subtitle Training Orchestra of the Chicago Symphony. We had a good resident conductor, but also occasionally, if the Chicago Symphony's guest conductors uh, had the desire to do that, they could come and work with us. It was a bit like the New World Symphony before the New World Symphony existed. So I had the opportunity to play under world-class figures such as Scholte, Giolini, Leinsdorf, Berenboim, and others, whose fire, and particularly whose conducting skill, made a real impression. I also occasionally played as an extra in productions at the Lyric Opera. I also played several times each year for the frequent visits to Chicago by the Joffrey Ballet, the American Ballet Theater, uh, the Royal Swedish Ballet, and several other dance troupes. I remember especially being surprised at Rudolf Nureyev's loud counting during some of his more spectacular solos, which could be heard readily in the pit. And I thought of the scene that was described uh, uh, of Nijinsky standing on a chair in the wings, uh, shouting numbers, countings, uh, for his dancers during the uh, initial 1913 Sacre de Pantin riots. One day in 1973, during a rehearsal break with the Civic Orchestra, I heard one of the players from the stand behind me mention the word gamba, and immediately turned around, apologizing for my accidental eavesdropping but uh, expressing my great interest in learning more about this instrument, of which I had not to that point yet seen a live example. Then you should go see the best gamba player in Chicago, Jose Vasquez, I was told. The best gamba player in Chicago. I immediately had a mental image of someone like the best clarinet player in Chicago, a 40 or 50 year old master player in the Chicago Symphony with decades of experience. Well, to my surprise, Jose turned to be up turned out to be a pre-med student at Northwestern. I went to hear one of his concerts, which was one of the worst I had ever heard up to that time, not from his playing, but from that of his colleagues. But I sat through it, and I went to speak with him afterwards. The concert had been in a church, and he was holding court in the sacristy, talking to many well-wishers in one corner, while well, his gamba sat on a chair in the other corner. May I try your gamba, I managed to insert. In response to his nod, I went over and picked it up. Having read about it, I propped it awkwardly between my knees, grabbed the bow, and tentatively played. And nailing that G on the E string with my second finger instead of on the D string with my fourth finger. Jose heard this and immediately dropped all the other conversations he was having and charged over asking, how could I play Bach? And I said I was a cellist with an interest in learning more. So he said, I have only two questions. One, can you read French? Two, where can I leave you a gamba? And the next day, at the appointed place, I found an East German bass vial, the Rousseau Traité de la Viole, and a note from Jose saying, we will play duets in one month. And we did. We worked together for just over one year before Jose left to study gamba and broke violin in Basel at the Scola Cantorum. I didn't feel entirely left in the lurch because for an autodidact, the gamba literature is quite revealing, well beyond Rousseau, with Christopher Simpson's division violist and the progressively more thoroughly annotated five books of Moray being prime examples. Working in this way, one can make a lot of progress. Shortly thereafter, I started to participate in Howard Mayer Brown's Collegium at the University of Chicago, playing in 
everything from Krumhorn quartets and Rebec consorts to continual parts in Monteverdi madrigals. And from that time I stayed in Chicago for about six years, going off in the summers to the Mozarteum in Salzburg to study with Antonio Yanigro for a different perspective. From there, armed with my Eurail pass, I began to explore some of Europe's instrument museums with my observational skills having been honed through the background of having assembled those kit harpsichords, having been exposed to a number of first-rate cellos and bows, and with the additional experience in gamba and other early instruments through my work with Jose and Howard Brown. Jose, meanwhile, had attended the Oberlin Baroque Performance Institute, then in its second year. He said that I absolutely must attend 1973's BPI. He and I went, and I had the chance to meet Jim and Kathy Caldwell and saw their, even at the time, impressive uh, kernel of their collection hanging on a wall, many gambas. And the next summer I went back for the entire three-week session, meeting over the course of that BPI and the next, several talented players and singers who have gone on to make big names for themselves, including some of your other speakers for this course, Tom. And at the end of the BPI session, I was allowed to play a Gemignani Sonata in the concert usually reserved for performances by the coached ensembles that were the mainstay of the BPI afternoon schedule. I know, Tom, that you'll also be speaking in this series with both Kathy Meitz and Marilyn McDonald, so I'll leave further discussion of BPI, of which it has been my pleasure to serve as the artistic director for nearly 30 years, to them. In 1976 at the Smithsonian, the keyboardist Jim Weaver who had known the Caldwells from their time in Washington as members of the National Symphony Orchestra before they moved to Oberlin, and who was a member of the BPI faculty for the first 20 or so summers, had put together a touring music, costumes, and dance extravaganza for the American Bicentennial called Music and Dance from the Age of Thomas Jefferson. The cast included Weaver, Albert Fuller, the flutist John Solom, cellist John Shu, dancers from Shirley Wynn's circle, and others. And this proved such a success that Jim was given permission to start, for the 1976-77 season, a nine-member group called the Smithsonian Chamber Players, which he planned in close collaboration with Jim Caldwell. Remembering that Gemignani performance, and also my shorn cello, one of only three Baroque cellos Jim knew of as being in anywhere in the States at that time, Caldwell suggested me to Weaver, who then also vaguely remembered that Gemignani performance, and so I made what would prove to me to be a fateful connection to the museum. We were nine in the chamber players, including Weaver, Caldwell, Marilyn McDonald, and myself. The tours were, in retrospect, rather cushy. We had a dedicated tour manager who came everywhere with us, and we went around with two very beautiful keyboard instruments made by Thomas and Barbara Wolf, an elaborately chinoiserie Emsch copy double manual harpsichord, copy from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts instrument, and a replica of the Smithsonian circa 1789 Dulcan Forte piano that Tom had just helped restore. Our repertoire at first contained some very well known pieces the Fifth Brandenburg, the uh, BWV uh, 202 Wedding Cantata, the Mozart G minor piano quartet, but also some interesting lesser known items. And while the historical harpsichord had already been in fairly common use by then, the sound of the forte piano, particularly for a work as widely performed as the Mozart, was, in the States, at least a real novelty at that time. I happened to live uh, in, at, around this time near to a discount department store called E.J. Corvettes. They went out of business in the early 1980s, but they had a buyer in their record department with a real ear, I think, for early music. I tried with, in my limited financial means, to buy all I could of what they had on offer. In that way, I got to know not only Gustav Leonhardt's playing, but also that of the Leonhardt consort, uh, that of several English vile consorts, the Illyrius Ensemble with the Cauchin brothers, Max von Egmont, Quadro Amsterdam, the Concentus Musicus Viennensis, and others, Viennensis, <laughs> and others. I uh, read last year the posthumously released history of the Concentus by its founder and one of my eventual teachers, Nicolas Harnacor. It bears the title, Wir sind eine Entdeckergemeinschaft, which you might translate as, We are a community of explorers. In the book, Harnacor relates many details about how he came to build the Concentus instrument collection, when, where, and with what repertoire they toured, and how each of their recordings was made. 
And I realized in going through the list that thanks to my anonymous friend, the Corvette's record buyer, I was listening to each new release within about six months of its issue. This helped me to learn, of course, the big Bach pieces, the Monteverdi pieces, etc. And I remember several high points, such as in 1972, hearing the Cochentis recording of Rameau's Castor et Pollux, A New Sonic World. I remember that very well, yeah. Or hearing on their 1973 recording of the Christmas Oratorio, the at that time newly identified Obo da Caccia. Wow, nothing like it. And you remember, Tom, that those LPs came with lavishly illustrated liner notes, including pictures of the instruments used. I was able to show my Danish violin maker more examples than just a few in Babbitts and, and Boyden, saying, uh, this is a good neck angle that I'd like you to try. You hold up the record, you hold up the record liner notes and say, make me one of these. Well, there, there wasn't a lot of other information at the time, and we could hear on the recordings that instruments set up like that actually worked. After finishing my conservatory studies, I had enrolled in the University of Chicago musicology program. In 1980, I got a Fulbright to go to Vienna, where I was to study German gamba repertoire with August Wenziger, who was then in his final year as guest professor of that instrument at the Hochschule, or Music Academy. At the same time, I was supposed to be researching what my advisor, Howard Brown, had determined I should produce for my dissertation. The German gamba counterpart of Jane Bauer's the French Flute School from 1700 to 1760, which she had written about a decade earlier. I dutifully spent many hours in libraries amassing quite a lot of handwritten copies of music from composers like Hesse, Graun, and uh, Italians like Ariosti and Draghi, who were part of the German school since they worked at the Viennese court. Particularly memorable were the days I spent in the cold room of the uh, Stiftung Preußische Kulturbesitz, where the reading room librarian seemed not to have the authority to turn on either the heating or the lights. Darkness falls very quickly in those northern reaches in the dead of winter, I learned. But I knew that's what had to be done. Both Wenziger and Harnenkor had huge libraries of hand-copied music. While much of Wenziger's remained unpublished, Harnenkor worked with the Viennese publisher Doblinger to issue a number of his discoveries, including many compositions from the incredible collection at Kronorich. Although I didn't know it at first, my Fulbright move to Vienna signaled a major inflection point in my professional life. Despite all the high-level experiences I had had to that point with the modern instrument world, I would henceforth devote myself, in the main, to historically informed projects, albeit ones that ranged very widely chronologically, mostly with instruments from various periods, but also as the second language of the late 20th century Baroque style began to filter into the mainstream, occasionally being invited to conduct modern instrument orchestras in repertoire from Bach to, say, Mendelssohn. I had applied for the Fulbright to Vienna not only because it was well situated for a number of library excursions that I had planned, but also because of Wenzinger's presence there at the Hochschule. And at that time, the Fulbright rules for music study seemed particularly favorable to the Vienna situation. I knew that Harnikor was teaching a seminar in Salzburg, so I enrolled there as well, enjoying a situation parallel to that of Ernst Christian Hesse, who had studied while on a diplomatic mission to Paris under one name with Marais and under a different one with Forcheret. Fortunately, neither Wenziger nor Harnikor ever discovered my musical duplicity, and I was able to profit from what each had to offer. The Fulbright rules strictly forbade grant recipients from accepting employment well on the stipend, so the only work I did that season, other than coming back a few times to Washington for chamber players' recordings, was to play with the Klementschich consort. Although he was even then a little out of the early music mainstream, I found René Klementschich to be an infectiously joyful musician, exuberant both as a recorder player and keyboardist, and in general. He had already a long-standing series of early music concerts in the smaller Brahmsaal of the Musikverein building, and introduced me through them to much specifically Austrian and Italian 17th and 18th century music, which was for him like terroir. He grew up in Vienna speaking Italian with his father, and the Viennese German dialogue called Wienerisch with his mother, and this reminded me both of the extent of the former Austrian Empire, which included his father's native Trieste, and of the Italian influences at the Viennese court, particularly from the 16th through the early 19th centuries. 
At the end of that school year, Wenzinger, uh, as was slated, retired from his guest professorship in Vienna and proposed me as his successor. One could still do that at the time in, in that milieu. I called Jim Weaver, who had generously given me a year's leave of absence from the chamber players, with the exception of those few recording projects for which I returned, and he gave me his congratulations on the job offer, but said that if I were instead to move to Washington, he thought that, quote, things could be made really interesting for me, end quote. Particularly since the museum had acquired its first Strad, the magnificent 1701 instrument known as the Servé Strad cello. I thought about that for a short time, remembering Mahler's statement that even when he had been given the most important musical job in the empire as director of the Vienna Court Opera, he still knew that he was three times an outsider as a native of Bohemia in Austria, as an Austrian among Germans, and as a Jew throughout the world. And so there I was excited by that Hochschule offer. I had to admit to myself that although my circumstances and Mahler's were not exactly parallel, between Harnico's extremely close-knit Viennese Concentus family on the one side of the music scene and the hulking bureaucracies of the two major orchestras and two opera companies on the other, I couldn't really imagine ever being totally accepted in the Austrian capital, despite the prestige that title Hochschule Professor would automatically bestow. And so at the end of the summer of 1981, I chose to cast my lot with Washington, and Jose Vasquez stepped in from Basel as what the Viennese tradition would call Wenzinger's Nachfolger, or successor. Jim Weaver had kept up the Dutch connections he had made in the 1950s when he and Alan Curtis had been the second and third of what would eventually become quite a string of American harpsichord students of Gustav Leonhardt. And when in the 1970s the Smithsonian acquired a quartet of four instruments by respected Italian makers of the 18th century, which had never been modernized or altered from their original condition, Jim asked Leonhardt's former Quadro Amsterdam colleague, the Dutch violinist Jaap Schroeder, who was still at that time leading his groundbreaking period instrument Quartetto Esterhazy, to come and play a short celebratory program using those instruments. And in that program, Marilyn McDonald, our Smithsonian General Players violist colleague, Melissa Grabiel, and I made up the rest of Jaap's ad hoc quartet. As part of his pledge to make things interesting, upon learning of the disbanding of the Quartetto Estahazi, Jim had the idea to invite Jaap, beginning in the 1982-83 season, to be a more stable presence in Washington for several months out of each season. The chamber players had by that time mounted some larger scale projects, including the first American period instrument recordings of Handel's Opus 3 Concerti Grossi and of Messiah, which Jim had conducted. And uh, Jim now asked Yap to establish the Smithsonian Chamber Orchestra as a classical period group. Realizing there was still a question as to what pitch should be used for such a venture, the viable option seemed to be 427 or 430. Using the national platform the Smithsonian offered, I convened a group of wind players, organologists, and woodwind makers to Washington to debate the issue, and 430 was selected. The Smithsonian's national platform also made possible a similar gathering around the issue of low, low French Baroque pitch a few years later, a 2015 symposium on the health of HIP programs in American higher education, and, to date so far, two string quartet academies, one in the early 2000s, coached by the Juilliard and Axelrod quartet members, and a more recent one, just last January, uh, devoted to the early quartets of Haydn. The orchestra, under Yop's direction, played four pairs of concerts each season, and eventually made recordings of a number of Mozart works, plus the first American period instrument recordings of Beethoven's first, second, and third symphonies. By 1984, Jim asked me to, to succeed him as artistic director of all the Smithsonian chamber music activities. Meantime, the Smithsonian String Quartet, in which Yap, Marilyn, and I were joined by Judson Griffin, was off to an auspicious beginning, eventually ending up touring in both the United States and Europe and recording music of Mozart, Haydn, Schubert, Jeho, and Beethoven. After 10 years, Marilyn and Judson left the group, and Jory Garrigue and David Schruti continued with the Op and Me for another four seasons. Three important changes affected my Smithsonian work in the latter half of the 1980s. First, following a very successful recording of Bach's St. John Passion, in which I led the Smithsonian Chamber Players and Chorus, 
Jim asked me to take a more active role in conducting the chamber orchestra. I invited Stanley Ritchie to join the project as concertmaster. And we continued exploring with the later Beethoven symphonies and also played works of Schubert, Mendelssohn, Ariaga, and others. With the Smithsonian chamber players and chorus, we presented many of the large Bach works, including recording in concert, the complete Christmas oratorio for a Christmas Day broadcast heard on NPR by perhaps our largest single audience ever. Secondly, a fine collection of over a dozen world-class violins, which had been anonymously placed on loan to the Smithsonian, plus the ever-increasing profile of our chamber music program, attracted the attention of Herbert and Evelyn Axelrod, who placed with us, first as loans and then eventually as gifts, three entire quartets of instruments by Stradivari, Niccolo Amati, and Jean-Baptiste Villon, establishing at the same time an endowment whose income was to be used to support concerts and recordings using those instruments and others from the collection. The Smithson Quartet was succeeded for a few seasons by a group called Party of Four, in which violist Stephen Dan and I were joined at any given moment by two of our three violinists. Ian Swenson, Mayumi Zeiler, whose uh, violinist sister Midori Zeiler has a large presence on the German Baroque music scene, and the Boston Symphony Concertmaster, Malcolm Lowe. In the late 1990s, the Axelrod Quartet was established growing out of Party of Four with more f fixed uh, personnel. Its most recent uh, roster included Mark Desterbay, the co-concertmaster of Franz Bruchens' Orchestra of the 18th Century, uh, Marilyn McDonald, uh, James Dunham, who had formerly been the violist in the uh, Cleveland Quartet, and myself. And it was also during this time that I met Anna Bielsma. He soon became a regular guest with the chamber players, inviting me at the same time to join his Amsterdam-based group, Archibudeli, which was just then beginning a long string of recordings for the producer Wolf Erikson, who, with his almost legendary reputation as Tonmeister for many of the foundational recordings on Das Alte Werk and his own Seon label, had been asked by Sony to found the Vivarte series. The Smithsonian chamber players did join Archibudeli on Sony for a series of recordings played on the Smithsonian Strads, among which my favorites remain those we made of the Schubert Quintet, the Spohr Sextet, and the Mendelssohn Octet. I also appeared on a number of Archibudeli recordings made in various European halls and churches, memorably including, among others, those of Reicha Quintets and the two Brahms Sextets. Jumping back to the early 80s, when I arrived in Washington, it seemed to me that there was quite a bit of interest going on in New York City, where many of the generation of students who had been in the orbit of Albert Fuller at Juilliard were just beginning to make names for themselves. And though I lacked that direct connection, I was eager to join, so when I was told that the freelance cello spaces were basically filled, but that there was an opening for violone, I procured an instrument and was soon traveling by Amtrak quite regularly back and forth between Washington and New York. And after a while, knowing that I also played the gamba, I was asked to do some things with it as well. Those were the days when many concerts were played in tails, which with all their accoutrements, such as uh, patent uh, leather shoes and so on, take up considerable space in a man's suitcase. And I remember the challenge posed by the two flights of steps in Penn Station between the tracks and the street level. After everyone else had disembarked, I would, with some difficulty, make my way out of the train and over to the steps. I'd carry the violone up to the first landing, then go back down, pick up the suitcase and the gamba. Reaching the landing with them, I'd then repeat the process to gain access to the main hall, uh, all the time looking around to make sure no one was going to steal anything. And looking back on it, I'm astonished that I kept that for as long as I did. But, as the possibility of organizing more Smithsonian projects increased, the New York freelance scene, which suffered from many of the same shortcomings that had plagued some of my less high-level Chicago jobbing, namely, never enough rehearsal time to make things really good, indifferent conducting, and a consequent lack of total commitment from the players, these all made me realize that the, all that schlepping really wasn't worth the effort, particularly since I now had a new Smithsonian ensemble, which to me was quite interesting. I did contain for a little while longer a connection with Jim Richmond's group, Concert Royal, enjoying particularly the opportunity to work with the flutist uh, Sandra Miller, the soprano Anne Monios, and the dancer of Catherine Tarosi's group. This was also about the time that I gave up my founding member position in the Bach Ensemble, 
which Steve Hammer had invited me to join several years before, and which in fact had its very first rehearsal at that very Gemischlich festival that you ran for so many years at Castle Hill, Tom. Although I found Joshua Rifkin's one singer or instrumentalist per part performances invigorating embodiments of what I had been convinced ever since the days of my Chicago box source studies had frequently been Bach's own practice, after a few recording projects with the Bach Ensemble, beyond the infamous so-called B minor madrigal, aka the B minor mass, Joshua and I realized that each other's basic concept of, concepts of rhythm were so divergent that neither of us was really enjoying this experience of working together as much as we had, and so Myron Lutsky took over my spot, making the string section consist entirely of ex-Juilliard players who had been in Albert Fuller's orbit about that new ensemble that I mentioned. Around the time that I moved to Washington, the pianist Lambert Orcus, who taught at Temple University, was invited by Mstislav Rostopovich, with whom he had been playing recitals, and who was the conductor and music director of the National Symphony in Washington at that time, to become that group's principal keyboardist. Lambert had already played a number of concerts at the Smithsonian with the Emerson String Quartet, which was at the very dawn of its career, and had also made a recording of works by the 19th century virtuoso pianist Louis Mora Gottschalk on a powerful 1865 Chickering piano from our collection, drawing some amazing sounds from it. So seeing the approach of the 1983 Brahms sesquicentennial, I asked Lambert if he might like to join violinist Linda Kwan and me in a commemorative all Brahms concert using the Smithsonian's 1892 Steinway, the plate of which Paderewski had signed, proclaiming, on this piano I played 75 concerts during the 1892-93 season, which was just about the time that Brahms said that he would prefer playing a Steinway or Bechstein for public performance over the Schreiker piano he kept in his studio. I invited my friend John Finson, who had been a few years ahead of me at Chicago, to join us. He had written a very interesting master's thesis on late 19th century style as captured in early 20th century recordings before he turned his attention specifically to Schumann and gave us a lot of recordings to listen to. This was, after all, nearly a decade before Robert Phillip published his important book, Early Recordings and Musical Style. Linda and Lambert played the G major sonata. He and I played the E minor sonata, and together we played the C major trio, trying to take into account all of the traits we had heard on the recordings. Flexibility of tempo, not always simultaneous bass and treble, uh, limited and very intentional use of vibrato, frequent glissandi, and so on. The next season, Lambert and I founded the Castle Trio, named after the original Smithsonian building, the Smithsonian Castle, with Marilyn MacDonald giving period-style performances of much of the trio repertoire with a variety of different pianos. Over nearly 30 years, until Lambert's ever-increasing schedule as duo partner for Anne-Sophie Mutter forced him to withdraw from our activities, we played a regular series of concerts at the Smithsonian, did some touring, and made a number of really groundbreaking hip recordings. Among these were the complete Beethoven trios for Virgin Classics, for which we also recorded the E-flat Schubert Trio and the Naturno before the label's sale to a French consortium interrupted our plans to record the B-flat Trio as well, Dvorak and Smetna Trios for the Smithsonian Collection of Recordings, and Clara and Robert Schumann for Friends of Music Records. I should point out that all of this was going on as the record labels of all sizes were seeking to build their CD catalogs, that digital format having burst on the scene in 1982. In 1992, Deutsche Harmonie Mundi, a small but well pedigreed label for which I had been recording for about six years, was swallowed up by the media giant BMG, and the new producer assigned to our account asked me to suggest some hip projects that had not, to that point, been undertaken. I mentioned in Alia that I'd always wanted to conduct a gut-strung rendition of Richard Strauss's Metamorphosen, which the composer had written to commemorate the destruction by the Second World War of the old German high culture of which he was one of the last representatives. BMG realized that we had enough lead time to record the project and release it in time for the 50th anniversary celebration of the war's end. The disc, which also contained Barbara's Adagio for Strings and several works of Elgar, was very successful and was followed up the next year by another project that contained the Adagietto from Mahler's Fifth Symphony, Mahler's orchestral arrangement of Beethoven's Opus 95, Quartetto Serioso, and Schoenberg's own orchestral version of Verklärte Nacht. 
Despite the glowing reviews of our interpretations, which relied heavily on a close study I had undertaken in the archives of the Nederlands Musik Institute in The Hague of scores by Mahler's friend and champion Willem Mengelberg, that was unfortunately to be the last of our BMG projects, as BMG jettisoned about 200 of its artists uh, just before being taken over by Sony. I was able to continue my Mala work on the Dorian label, bringing together members of the Smithsonian Chamber Players and the Santa Fe Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra, which I led in the early years of this century, to record large-scale chamber arrangements for 10 to 15 people made for Schoenberg's post-World War I Verein, or Society for Private Musical Performances. We recorded the Fourth Symphony, Songs of the Wayfarer, and the Das Lied von der Erde, for which we received a Grammy nomination. The chamber players also recorded Schoenberg's first chamber symphony, a work which I've been introduced to in Chicago by Ralph Shapey for Dorian, and more recently released a CD of my own Verein style arrangements of the Mahler Rückert Lieder and Kindertotenlieder for the Friends of Music label. We're just about to issue a recording containing the Stravinsky symphonies of wind instruments and three pieces originally written for Washington, Stravinsky's Dumbarton Oaks Concerto and Copland's Appalachian Springs Suite and Nonette. And I currently have in my editing queue the Bartok Divertimento and music for strings, percussion, and celeste. When I enumerate these projects and consider that in nearly 40 years of quartet playing at the Smithsonian, I've had the opportunity to play on gut strings and on some great instruments, all of the Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schumann, Brahms, and Bartok quartets, all but the earliest of the Schubert quartets and most of the Schoenberg and Shostakovich quartets, plus a great deal of the piano trio literature, from Haydn through Ives, I have to admit that despite my love for all the Baroque works I've played, recorded, and led over the years, I, I simply can't put that part of my background aside. No reason that early music should be insulated, is there? I mean, the question I have for you and I have for everybody is, what do you see? Where do you see us going in the future, Ken? You've been, you, you've had a very long and distinguished and illustrious past and present at the Smithsonian. What do you think is going to happen to I don't know, to the world, to early music, to whatever it is we do. What do you predict? I'm no great prognosticator, Tom, I'm afraid, and frankly, don't know. I'd love to have a conversation with you sometime about whether you would have pursued your musicology career had you known when it began where that field would be today. The more insidious aspects of the Cultural Revolution of the 60s have impacted the larger classical music ecosphere in ways that I think no one could have predicted, and not always for the better. On the other hand, who could have imagined in, say, 1995, that Juilliard, that bastion of musical conservatism, would today have an early music program? Unheard of. Do you remember, Tom, in about the Jurassic period, I think, when you and I served together on one of the first incarnations of the Early Music America board? and there were protracted and not always fruitful discussions about what our journal could and could not contain. No reviews, that would be too self-serving. Some scholarly article in each issue to give it gravitas, but also some things that could be enjoyed by the lay enthusiast and so on and so on. And in frustration, I think it was in frustration anyway, you said that EMA ought to be in the business of putting itself out of business. Well, in the sense that the hip has become almost mainstream, we've been successful in achieving that goal, and the successor to our Early Music America journal has become EMAG, or what I like to call People Magazine for Early Music. I think that's a good thing. Yes, but where will it all go next? What I liked about that title of Harnikor's History of the Concentus is that it really did feel at the time like being part of a community of explorers. We were young then, of course, and everything felt new, but we were constantly asking questions like, what are some of the shared characteristics of the music of Bieber, Schmelzer, and Klammer? Or what else did Bertali write? Or where can I find an old pre-tort style, uh, pre style bow that's been neglected for years? Or who could I ask to make a good one for me? Or where does, what does Raoul have to say about the use of thumb positions? Listening about a decade ago to some of those CD re-releases, -re of the seminal recordings from the late 60s and 70s, I was struck by just how fresh or even off the wall they often seem. Now, in retrospect, they didn't seem they didn't seem that way at the time when when you hadn't heard performances of. But no, they did then too. This was the Entdecker mentality. Frescobaldi or Rosenmüller or Rameau played not like it was something that would make you hold your nose, 
but played with, if I can use the word in this context, all of the guts you'd hear in a fine performance these days of, say, uh, Sacre du Printemps. The danger element was always lurking not far from the surface. It seems different now when the HP movement has driven a lot of Baroque music out of the repertoire of modern orchestras. Fifteen years ago when I went to work with modern orchestra, it was sometimes difficult to make them understand what I wanted. But now that Baroque as a second language has become so much more widely accepted, and many of the younger players at least have the idiom in their ears, even if they've never studied it formally, things can go much more smoothly. Harnacourt used to say that the single element he found most destructive in a lot of music is that so often everything is ironed out, and he used the word, uh, the verb glatt gebügelt, which is how you might describe a sheet after you've worked on it with your steam iron to remove all of the creases. Wow. If there's a downside to the way that globalization has affected our field, it could be that if everybody speaks that second language in the same way, it can become like the English heard in the halls of the European Union's headquarters in Brussels. Perfectly understandable, but tending towards the more than ever so slightly bureaucratically stilted. I'm convinced that the most intrepid explorers of the new generation will seek some of the same excitement that motivated those of us who were working earlier capitalizing on whatever it was that excited them and attracted them to HIP in the first place. Find out what the composer is trying to say. Albert Fuller used to speak of the then of now and the now of then, and in the biography he wrote of his great friend and patroness, Alice Tully, which is entitled Alice Tully, an Intimate Portrait, but which might equally have been called Albert Fuller's story, Reading Between the Lines, he tells that the first time Miss Tully came to tea in his apartment. He showed her the two dozen or so engravings of 17th and 18th century French musicians, writers, painters, and architects of Le Grand Siècle that decorated his walls, explaining what each had done. And at the end, she said, and I'd like to quote him now, so please forgive if I actually read, uh, Albert, dear, just now I saw such pain in your face that I wanted to ask why speaking of these great figures disturbed you so. And after making initial denials that that was the case, he blurted out, well, I guess the pain you saw came from the fact that I know these men and their work so well, but they don't know me. Whereupon she immediately grasped his wrist and asked, how do you know that? It was, Albert wrote, as if a veil blocking any and all consideration of metaphysical understanding suddenly lifted. I felt prepared for newer images to be revealed. And that is perhaps what he meant by the then of now, the now of then. We're living our 21st century lives, but trying as best as we can to find that communication, that excitement that the music holds for us. Doing our best to hold a time-defying dialogue with the masters of the past. In the early years of the historically informed performance movement, there was a real variety of approaches, which you can hear in many of those recordings I've referenced. To my ear, at least, much of this has been ironed out in so many look-alike or sound-alike performances. Your challenge for the future is to go back to the excitement and the variety that got you started and many other people started in the early days. Yes, it's not that the students now shouldn't profit from all the experiences we've had, but after all, we might have somehow turned down the wrong path at a certain moment. Go back to the primary sources. Learn more about rhetoric. Learn more about language. So many instrumentalists don't even bother to do this, even for those big works I listed earlier that should be, in my opinion, their bread and butter. I'm sorry to have to say that more than once I've asked while teaching, what's going on here? And at times, even the singers can't really answer, let alone the instrumentalists. You might play or sing a Bach cantata aria beautifully, but do you know its biblical references? Do you know the rhetorical import? There's all that to be discovered, and the process of discovering makes the experience of participating, to my mind, all the richer. I hope that we don't get in Baroque music to the point that so many orchestral players have reached. They may play spotlessly, but don't have to put much independent thought, once learning how to do it, into fitting into that large corporate sound. The ones I most admire are those who find opportunities for themselves outside of the orchestra to play recitals or chamber music. But there are also those who are part-time realtors or insurance salesmen because for them, music, the 
Hol de Kunst, or Lovely Art, of Schubert's unforgettable ode, An die Musik, is just a gig and not all-consuming. I think it's, uh, it certainly is for you, and I, I do hope that the people who have the pleasure of, of hearing our conversation will have some sense of how far we've come, how far we have to go, and what the chief underlying values are, at least from your point of view. I have to say I, I agree with you completely, and I'm really honored that you would take all this time to talk to all of us. So thank you very, very much indeed, Ken Slowly.